Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport June 26th between uh, flights crossing the country and returning to the United States Steve Lacey welcome to the mid-continent I don't know how much time you've spent out in this area well uh, Minneapolis being the uh, uh, stopover point we've been through the airport a couple of times already and it's not finished yet we're coming back here to play next week well this is certainly uh, an insulated part of the world of the uh, scene and uh, the warmth and the uh, history of Paris I think of one name really in terms of jazz history and he seems to cross uh, your uh, your influence and that is the king of Paris Sidney Bechet absolutely as part of the lure of Paris and part of the allure also and uh, uh, certainly I'm following in his footsteps uh, uh, being over there as long as I have and uh, well I can't say that his shoes fit me, you know, but the, the footsteps do. Well, I hear the sounds of Les Onions and Petit Fleur and uh, Artu Le Cafard wailing in the distance. When you heard Bechet uh, for the first time, uh, what struck your ear and your heart and your soul? Well, I think the, um, the heat of the sound and, and the swing that he had and the inventiveness and the beautiful uh, tone. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, like a beautiful uh, soprano voice, really. But the first time I'd heard that voice. Your soprano has taken many uh, turns and twists since that time. And uh, there have been, there's been the impact of Thelonious Monk. Uh, the, only, uh, the only touch that I remember, other than his music, of course, is a small cigarette hole, which I... Uh, burn in my coat, which I treasure. <laughs> you, you, you got the full impact of Thelonious Monk on the stand. Well, yeah, I worked with him a couple of years in the big band and in the quintet, and I studied his music for. Well, I'm still studying it really for many years, and uh, also I had a band that played nothing but his music, and so I've been involved with it for, well since '55, really about 30 years. How would you describe Monk in terms of his contributions? Well, he's one of the giants, one of the, uh, uh, you know, the model. He's a, 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 a father figure for the whole bebop revolution. He was the brains behind it. Uh, that was like, and his house was headquarters for all that. And uh, he was, but he was also active uh, from the 30s even, and, the, and all through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. I mean, he had a long career, and it spanned uh, many uh, periods. And he was he was very important um, uh, theoretically, and actually the two. I mean, he was a, a model band leader, a composer, and a pianist. He was an all-around musician, great uh, great figure. Of his compositions, and as you uh, have played them and studied them. Uh, what has been revealed to you that you can describe in terms of words without uh, simply getting that horn over there and interpreting? Well, the horn is important because uh, it fit my horn. And uh, um, in the 50s, there was nobody playing soprano. I didn't know what to play on it, really. I had to find some music that would fit the instrument and also fit me and be interesting. And uh, so I, uh, luckily, in, I, in 1955, I discovered Monk monk and his music and I began uh, experimenting with his pieces and they fit they fit me to a T. Is there any particular theme that uh, monk uh, floated out there for us to listen to over and over again that you know, holds a special uh, sort of uh, magic for you? Well evidence. Evidence is one I studied a lot and revealed many things about rhythm and dynamics and uh, harmony and everything to me but I think each one of his pieces is a gold mine and the more you get into it, the more you get out of it. Are you, in turn, beginning to write uh, in, a, in a way that, uh, you know, advances all of Thelonious's theories? Well, I've been uh, writing for a long time now, about uh, 20, 25 years now. And uh, I, think, uh, I think my stuff is starting to catch up. Uh, the way his did also but uh, you know 
um, a monk wrote around midnight when he was 18 years old and it was played around here and there but it didn't really take off until miles recorded it much later in 1955 than other people and so it, it takes time for uh, uh, music to mature like wine. It gets old, and then you can drink it when it's old enough. But you can't drink it when it's too new. Only the guy who made it can drink it. Well, as you've watched your maturing process in this, over these decades here, with reference to your writing, uh, what's your uh, feeling about that maturation and that maturing? Well, it has to do with people. It has to do with the people I write for and the, and the people I'm lucky enough to work with over a long period of time. And they learn the music and I learn from them. And it's a constant, uh, well, it's a collaboration, really, yeah, because uh, paper is mess in terms of music. It, it, it's not the paper, it's the people. And so what I put on paper, it, it, it has to be... Uh, it has to be swallowed by the people I work with. It, they ha it has to go down well and they have to... Um, they have to work on it over a period of, we work on it together over a period of years until it becomes good. The name Cecil Taylor enters your, uh, your sphere of uh, experience and learning process and performance. Uh, how, did he, how does Cecil Taylor, say, differ from Thelonious Monk and, and, and what sort of an impact did he make on you? Well, Cecil was the one who showed me Monk. He told me to go hear Monk, really. He took me by the hand and said, come, come, listen to this. And also in Cecil's group, we played some of Monk's tunes. So that was my first experience. Uh, Cecil showed me many things. He was uh, uh, absolute, uh, my guide and uh, master in the 50s. Uh, he, uh, he discovered me and, and I worked with him from 53 to 59, six years. And uh, he took me out of, out of the Dixieland and put me into the... Uh, into the contemporary uh, and uh, we were so contemporary that people were scared to death of us back then you know the critics the musicians and the owners but nevertheless we did uh, play quite a few places and we we worked together for about six years and was for me it was uh, my education my baptism Steve Lacey I'd like to just reflect on the name P.B. Russell for although he was steeped you know in the chicago and uh, traditional style of jazz he was out there breaking some boundaries and uh, moving beyond well i was lucky enough to work with him quite a few times when i was very young i played at the concerts uh, the uh, every weekend they had uh, what they call dixieland concerts at uh, two places in new york with a uh, big pitchers of beer and two bands and uh, this went on for years, and I, I was lucky enough to come, all, come along at a time when I worked with all those guys who were active in this uh, series, and some of them were from Chicago, some from Kansas City, some from New Orleans, and some from other places. But uh, Pee Wee was one of the stars of those uh, sessions, and I got to, you see, the fact that I played soprano means I wasn't competing with anybody else. There was nobody else. So I could be added on to a band like with that already had a clarinet, like with Pee Wee Russell. So I got to play with him quite a few times. And, well, the show, it was a priceless, priceless experience. He was a genius, you know. He was a, a, a lovely fellow, really, uh, uh, and very funny, too, and witty and, in, and really inventive, original, completely original player. Also an audiovisual artist, too, uh, having done some painting, I believe. Well, I didn't know him. I didn't know him that well. No, I never saw his painting, no. Did you see his painting? Yeah. Oh, it must be amazing. <laughs> Indeed. Steve Lacey, uh, as we uh, wait between planes here, uh, it seems to me that um, you just uh, have a tremendous perspective uh, and... and uh, span and 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 uh, uh, a vision uh, of your music um, as you as you sit in the uh, French environment as a residence there um, what do you see uh, developing in new music and uh, as uh, rooted to the uh, the jazz tradition in America well um uh, the thing that keeps me in Paris is not what's going on in Paris, but it's my group, really, because they all live there. I have uh, uh, Steve Potts on saxophone, Irene A.B. on uh, voice and strings, uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Avenel bass, uh, Bobby Few piano, 
Oliver Johnston drums. And these people I found in Paris in the early 70s. And we've been playing together ever since then. And uh, that's what keeps me in Paris. But also, uh, Paris is... Paris is fun, it's nice, I like it, I speak French, and I can move around to all the other places in Europe. But um, wherever you can function is the best place to be. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, Minneapolis or Paris. You know, if you can, if you can fulfill your, your thing and realize your potential, well, that's the place to be, really. Is there a, a real uh, uh, environmental stimulus in Paris for your music? the audience, for example, and a place for you to play? Well, yeah, the audience is good. Paris, they've always loved jazz in Paris since the teens, the 20s, the 30s, and all that. And there's a history and a sense of history, and more important than that is that they respect artists there, and uh, they, they consider us artists, and they treat us well. And, um, uh, you know, in America, it's, it's not quite that realization of uh, what... Uh, what the thing is about really gets mixed in with the entertainment and uh, and uh, pop music and this and that so uh, over there there's less confusion for us and there's more of a clear appreciation of what we do however that's beginning to happen here too so I think uh, back and forth is what's happening for me but the European audience is, is excellent very good very smart well there is truly a global development isn't there well, look, we we play in uh, we play in Italy, all over the place, in little towns, and we play in Japan, we play in Canada, and everywhere. And the people are waiting for us, and they like the music really. So there's no uh, locality anymore. It could it's a music that travels well. Do you see any uh, uh, hope that um, the industrial commercial side of the presentation of uh, new music and jazz? Uh, is taking a turn that might be more positive. Environments that you can play in that uh, uh, are conducive for both the musician and the audience. I think there's a new level of appreciation for live music in general and for creativity in particular. Uh, people are beginning to realize just what art is all about, what, uh, what it is, what it's for, how it works, and what to do with it. And so uh, I hope it uh, catches on more, really. But there's also a lot of confusion and a lot of pollution with some, some silly. I mean, some some really, you know, uh, the, with machinery and everything. It's gotten so easy to 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 put out a, a very uh, slick product, and people get confused for a while. But I don't think they stay. You know, after a while, they get hungry for the real thing, and there's that's where we come in. There is danger in the electronics, uh, the toys and technology. Yeah, but it wears thin after a while, you know? The people get bored, really. It's strange. You don't have to worry about it because they get bored. You can only fool the, the people some of the time. Yeah, it seems so. Or for a while. For a while. <laughs> Steve Lacey, it's a pleasure to talk to you between flights and catch you somewhere between Paris and the mid-continent here on a beautiful June day in the Land of Lakes country. Uh, thank you, Leigh pleasure.